Well, good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bible today, and get it out and turn to the book of Proverbs. As a like I kind of said before, today, as in some other times, we're not going to be really parked in one particular place in this uh, in Proverbs today. We're kind of going to run all over the place, but we will generally stay in Proverbs, so that's a good place for you to get your Bible turned to starting out this morning. The purpose of Proverbs, the reason Proverbs is in our, our Bible, Proverbs says, is to help us learn how to grow in wisdom. Wisdom is both a gift from God, it's something that God gives us, but it's also something we're supposed to go out and pursue. We're supposed to go out and, and look for it. It's something that we're supposed to try to get. It's almost like if there was a marketplace for wisdom, and perhaps there is, that you're supposed to go to that marketplace, you're supposed to go and you're supposed to you know, find it and, and take all the money that you have with you and buy as much wisdom as you possibly can. The way we, we both receive wisdom and we find wisdom <coughs> is for asking for it in prayer, but it's also looking for it in God's Word. We find wisdom in scriptures, but we also find it in, in scriptures, but we also find it in the world. We, we find wisdom by paying attention to what's going on around us, from learning from the mistakes that others make. We find wisdom from learning from our own mistakes. We find wisdom from listening to each other. We find wisdom in receiving feedback. In all these ways, we, we find wisdom. It helps us grow in wisdom. And my hope is that as we've gone through these series of teachings, there were these, and there's a couple of few weeks left possibly, that this has built a, or possibly rekindled a fire or a passion with inside you for, for gaining wisdom, for, for not neglecting that, for looking for it, for growing in wisdom, for adding more wisdom to our lives. And we're, we're not doing this for our, just our own benefits, but we're also doing it for the benefit of others. Because one of the things this world needs, more possibly than anything else, is the world needs more wise Christians. One of the ways we, as followers of Christ, can attract our skeptical neighbors to Christ is by demonstrating a Christ-like life, a Christ-like wise way of living. And we do that in every facet of our lives. That would be something worth noticing. You know, if you want to set yourself apart from those fools around you, it's really not too hard. Just grow in wisdom. Just, just gain wisdom. I mean, would you possibly want to be like that, that person at work that everybody, you know, respects? That, you know, you go to work and, every, you know, everybody comes to you. You're, you're the go-to guy, you know, for advice. I mean, you come thinking, oh, I don't want to be that guy, but no, I, I think you probably really do. You want to be the person there that's views that viewed as, you know, you know, ask them. Ask him. Ask her. I mean, he knows. I mean, she knows. They're wise. Wouldn't you want to be that person? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to have more opportunities to explain to others, to, to give others, you know, your testimony? To, to talk about the difference that following Christ makes in your life? And many times the door opens to talk to somebody like that, to, to share Christ with somebody. That door opens because we're demonstrating something different. We're demonstrating wisdom in how we live. Because when we can control our emotions, we, we can control that part of our mind, when we can manage our anger, when we use our words well, when we're not tearing other people down, or we're building them up, we're encouraging them, when we tend our garden you know, with diligence, we, we tend to the gardens of our lives, and we, when we're productive members of, of our communities, when we do all those things, that encourages and it invites others to around us to to take Jesus more seriously. <clears throat> you know, for me, I can, I can really see that there really is a missional aspect to wisdom. Wisdom is something that we don't just learn for ourselves, we learn for the community. It's not selfish. It's not just that I want to be you know, wise for me. I, I, I want to be more wise for, 
for you, and I want to be more wise for, for others that you come in contact with. Now, the way we've been studying Proverbs is we've been doing these character sketches. There's this broad category of the fool when you read through Proverbs. And there's all kinds of different fools. We've looked at you know, a bunch over the last several weeks of different kind of fools that, that illustrate. And what they're illustrating is the opposite of wisdom. You know, if you want to know what wisdom looks like, then you just do the opposite of whatever these guys are doing. You know, they're describing this in Proverbs, like, don't be this kind of fool. And the character we're going to meet this morning is really kind of hard to describe with, with just like a single word. There's a struggle, you know, trying to describe this character. And at first, it was that, you know, we could just call him, we could call him the, the greedy. But, you know, if we call him that, then you know, greedy makes us think that it's all about money. But then if, you know, if we think about, well, we could call him, we could call him the blood. But when we think about blood, we think about it's all about food. So I think the combination is really the answer here. So today it is the... The greedy glutton. Because the greedy glutton's problem is really bigger and deeper than money or food. Here's some of what Proverbs has to say about this type of fool. Proverbs 15, verse 27. The greedy bring ruin to their households, but the one who hates bribes will live. In Proverbs 28, verse 25. The greedy stir up conflict. But those who trust in the Lord will prosper. Proverbs 29, 4. By justice, a king gives a country stability. But those who are greedy for bribes, tear it down. And then Proverbs 23, starting verse 20. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor. And drowsiness clothes them in rags. If you want to be clothed in rags, then be a greedy what? The greedy, they, they, can, they can wreck a family. The greedy, they, they can bring a nation or a company to their knees. The greedy can destroy the peace in a community. The greedy, they can eat and drink or, or consume themselves into poverty. They, they into misery or, or even into oblivion. There's a, there's a line from a classic movie uh, from back when I was younger. <clears throat> Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, played by Michael Douglas, says, greed is good. And, and he's proud of it. And greed is good. <clears throat> and his young apprentice hears him say that and, and he believes them. And it turns out that greed is actually good if your goal is to go to jail. Or how about that old saying from Wall Street? Bulls make money, bears make money, but they slaughter hogs. The road to destruction is overflowing with greedy gluttons. The problem for the greedy glutton, as I said, it's not money. It's not food. It's desire. And the greedy glutton's problem is that he or she cannot manage that desire, that hunger, that, that longing for, for more. More food, yeah. And more money, sure. But also more power, more fame, more, more glory, more recognition. It's just that, that hunger for more. And the ability to manage this hunger, this, this control that, you know, that we need to have for this desire, to, to somehow be able to steward those, those desires that are aroused within us, is an essential skill for every single human being on this planet. Now, while you may be craving some, something different than I am, I mean, we, we all crave different things. You can crave one thing, I, I can crave another. It seems that that hunger for more is quite universal. It's a universal human trait. We've all got it. We've got, a, we've got it gnawing at us inside of us. Proverbs 27, verse 20. It 
It says, just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. And death has an appetite. It seems the realm of the dead seems seem to have this endless space. Death is always hungry for just one more. <clears throat> death always has it's got room for that, that one more. And it's the same way Proverbs says that human desire, it's just never satisfied. We're always, 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 always hungry for more. You just can't have enough. You just need a little bit more. And then a little bit more. And then a little bit more. And then even, you know, just a little bit more. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. Or like this. You ever see these before? I think it's why it's so hard. You know that sound? Forming the bed in the bowl. You smell the bag as you're opening it up. It's so hard to eat just one. Right? I mean, anybody here want to try it? You, you can come up and you can get it. Just one this morning. Just one. I mean, this isn't communion. This, this is totally something else going on here right now. But it's hard to eat just one. You're not going to eat just one, are you? I mean, if you're smart, you won't put yourself to that test. I mean, for me, smelling that, right, it's just it's, it's a little bit, i got to drink the water. I could probably do this. but Because, you know, if you eat just one, it's going to arouse inside of you an appetite, a hunger. I mean, some of you are already tasting it in your mouth, aren't you? I mean, I can see it right now. You're, you're, you haven't even eaten one yet. And, and you just feel it. It's that hunger. It's that craving. You know, it's, you know if you eat just one, well, then you're just going to eat another one. And another, and another, and another. And at some point, <clears throat> you're just going to you know, be doing the slide dive right into the bowl, aren't you? You won't stop eating until they're all gone. That's why they make those little tiny bags now, because, you know, they get all gone. And, you know, at least you haven't done too much damage. But why is that? Well, really, it's it mostly, you know, because of the salt. I mean, that's... But it's possibly because when they created these chips back in the 60s, they sprayed it with a special ingredient made, created by the CIA to, you know, to, to help the farmers. That's what they wanted to do, help the potato farmers, so we, we ate more chips. Maybe it's a, a conspiracy, but I... I ah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? I mean, literally and, and metaphorically. Because human desire, it's, it's a bottomless pit. It goes on and on and on. And to manage this desire... To manage this hunger, it requires maturity, training, and it requires a level of deep, deep wisdom. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16, says, if you find some honey, I mean, if you find honey, that's, that's nice, right? You're just going through life, you find some honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and it will make you sick. What's the difference between a content, happy, sage, content, happy, wise man, and a sick, greedy glutton? Well, that sage, he knows when to say when. The wise person knows when enough is enough. I mean, he says, that's enough. He offered me another piece of pie, he's like, no, nope, that's, that's enough. I need to stop. That, that's it for me today. I mean, that's all. I'll come back for tomorrow, maybe. But that, that's enough. He doesn't have to finish the pie. He just has enough. Isn't that the, possibly one of the hardest things to do in the world, though? Knowing when enough is enough? Because you know it doesn't taste, it taste nearly as good tomorrow as it does when it's fresh and it's hot right from the oven, right? I mean, it's just... You gotta know when to say when. And then, not just being able to say it, but to do it. You know, 
up with that's enough. It doesn't seem like at times that the world is, is set up to help us with this. It's more set up the other way, right? Not to satisfy us, but to enable us with this endless stream. There, there's, this, there's, there's bowls of chips everywhere. There's one right next to you. There's one in the field behind you and in front of you. and They're everywhere. And you take one and you're doomed. Because everywhere you go, there's, there's another bowl. Then there's another bowl, and there's another bowl. I mean, you can go to the store, and there's, there's another bowl right there. They're cheap. You want one? You walk in the door, and the greeter says, you want one? Here's a free one. You want more? I mean, sometimes it seems that life is just set up to frustrate our desire to say, that's enough. You don't want to be rude, so you just take one more. There's a story about a man who wanted nothing more than to live just a simple life. To, to spend his life, in the, in, spend his time in a time of prayer, life in a prayer. So he found a teacher. And the teacher said, told him what he needed to do. He said, sell all your possessions, and all you're just going to keep, you're just going to keep up a little prayer hut, a little plot of land, a little prayer hut, and a loincloth. You know, that's all you're going to have. It's just these, these few possessions. And you're going to you're going to live like that, the teacher says. You're going to live like that in that hut. You're going to spend every day in, in, in this, this simple life of prayer and worship. Just staying in your hut and, and, and praying, you know, in your little loin clock there. And the teacher, you know, told the disciple what to do, left him in the hut. And he says, okay, I'll come back for you one of these days, and, and I'll just see all you're doing. But until then, here's your instructions. So just, just stay in here. Stay in your hut and pray. Well, that's what the man did. The man prayed every day, wearing his loincloth. Very simple existence. And at the end of the day, sometimes he would take his loincloth off and he would wash it. Then, you know, set it up to dry. But when he would come back to his loincloth, he would find that there were some rats around his hut and they were nibbling and gnawing at his loincloth and tearing it to shreds and, you know, like, it's not, not so good, right? So he complained to the local villagers about the rats, and he asked them for some more material so that he could make a new loincloth. And they gave him some material. But then the rats ate the second one. Then the rats ate the third one. And finally the villagers have said, okay, enough with the rats and the loincloth. And you know, what you need to do is you need to get yourself a cat. A cat will take care of the rats. And so they gave him a cat. And that was the end of the rats. But this cat, being in the middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning, it was meow, gets on his head, starts walking around, meow, meow, he couldn't sleep. He had no peace. So he complained to the villagers. He comes and like, this cat you gave me. I mean, I think they said, you know, have you been feeding them some milk? He says, I don't have any milk. He said, you need to give that cat some milk. So the villagers, they gave him some milk. That took care of the cat. But eventually he ran out of milk. So he came back and he asked the villagers for more milk, and the villager says, you know what you really need? You need a cow. Because if you had a cow, you, 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 you don't have all the milk that you need for that cat who will take care of your rats. And so they gave him a cow. And so now he has this cow, and there was plenty of milk for the cat and, 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 the, and the cows. Well, you know, cows, they've got to eat too. The cow needs some feed. So he went back to the village, and he begged the villagers, he says, can you please give me what I need for my cow? And they said, well, yeah, we can, but look, we're, we're not going to do this forever. You know what you should do. You've got a little bit of land there around your hut. Why don't you start planting some crops so you can grow some feed for your cow? So he did. He became a little farmer. And he was a really good farmer. And soon in his little farm, it grew into a big farm. And he had all kinds of grain. He had all kinds of crops. His, his farm was flourishing. People were coming from miles around, and they were buying what he was there growing. And he had more than one cow now, more than one cat, but no rats. But you know, this all became so complicated that he really couldn't manage it by himself. He complained to the villagers nearby. He says, I don't know what I'm going to do. This has, gotten, this has gotten totally out of hand. He says, you know what you need? You need a wife. You need a partner. You know, someone who can manage this farm with you and help you do all this work. He's, he says, let, me, let us help you find a bride. 
And so they did. He got married. And she was a wonderful manager, a wonderful partner. And the farm continued to flourish. So now he's got a wife, and he's got kids, and he's got lots of cows and cats and activity and, and no rats. And he has this huge estate. He had to build a, a bigger house to hold everything. And then one day, his master, his teacher, came back to check on him, expecting to find him sitting in his little hut, you know, boiling cloth. But instead, the master comes back and walks into this, this huge mansion, surrounded by this vast estate and all these crops and, and this beehive of activity and things coming and going. And the teacher says, what in the world has happened to you? And the man says, this is what I had to do to keep my loin cloth. Church, that's the way it works, doesn't it? I mean, you start here, and then, and then you just give it a little bit, and then a little more, and then a little more, and then a little more, and, and how do you know when to say when? How do you know when enough is enough? I mean, years ago now, it was you know, J.D. Rockefeller. He's probably not remember. He's kind of been a while, but there was a an inter, um, somebody was interviewing him, and they they asked him this question. They asked J.D. Rockefeller, you know, how much money is enough? Maybe you don't remember this Rockefeller guy. I mean, he was a billionaire in back in the early 1900s. You know, back when a billion dollars was actually a lot of money. It's kind of a joke. I kind of think it still is, but maybe not. I, I don't know. Tell me not. But the reporter asks him, you know, how much money is enough? And Rockefeller is famous for giving this response. Just a little bit more. How do you know when to say when? How do you know when you have enough? Well, maybe... Maybe we don't. Maybe we just don't. We, I mean, we don't know. Maybe we need to depend on God to show us. There's this great prayer from one of the wise men of Israel, Agar, son of Jacob. He's mentioned in Proverbs chapter 30. And some of his sayings are there in Proverbs. And, and this is his prayer. And so it goes. This is what he says. Proverbs chapter 30, starting in verse 7. It says, oh God, I beg two favors of you. Let me have them before I die. First, help me never tell, to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. Now, Agar, he was a wise man. He was a sage, and he says, Lord, please don't give me too much. Don't make me rich. Because I've been paying attention. I've been in your world, I've been walking around, I've been looking, and I can see what happens when people have too much. Too much money, too much food, too much power, too much anything. He says, I've seen it, Lord. If you give me too much, I will forget you. I will be tempted to think that I can survive on my own resources instead of depending upon you. So Lord, please don't give me too much. Because I know I can't handle it. But Lord, please don't give me too little either. He says, because I've seen the evil that can come when, when people don't have enough food. When people don't have enough shelter or, or clothing. When they don't have the bare essentials of life. I can see what kind of happens in that situation. If I have too little, I might, might become desperate, and I might do something to dishonor your name. So Lord, give me just enough. Just enough to meet my needs. Just enough to satisfy my hunger. But how much is this? But how much is that? I mean, you know, in the last few decades, there have been a number of studies that they, where they've looked at the relationship between money and happiness and, and contentment. And there is a fairly substantial body of research now that can help us see a connection. One of the things that the research has showed us is that, now get this, 
Money can buy happiness. I know, right? But only up to a certain point. And that point is different for different people, depending on where you live or in the world or in the country even. But whether you live in a city or you know, the standards of living, living where you're at, the cost of living. But either way, there's a point. And research validates this, that there's a point where, where you have enough money to meet your basic needs, so you know, not too little, then we have enough money that we have a little bit of buying power to you know, purchase things and you know, take care of the things that we want. If we, have, we have enough money to, to think about the future so that we have some flexibility on the way that we make our plans for the future. You know, just, just a little flexibility. Just, just enough to meet your needs and, and enough to buy a few things that you, you really want, but you don't necessarily need these things, but you know, just, a, just a little bit. But then also enough to know that you know, I'm okay for today, but I also know that I'm, I'm, I'm storing up, I'm going to be okay tomorrow too. And that's the point. That, that, that's the point where there is maximum contentment and satisfaction and happiness. If you're living in poverty, you don't have that same level of happiness, contentment, or, or satisfaction. But you know, what's interesting is that once you cross that line, where when you have enough to meet your needs, to, to give you some satisfaction, to you know, you know, to store up a little bit for the future, but not, you know, getting more money does not lead to greater levels of happiness, contentment, and satisfaction. In fact, what they found is that once you cross that threshold, it all starts to work against you. The more money you have, the easier it is to be less content with what you have. Because you start comparing yourself with with other people. You start playing this game of, of look who has the nicest car, or oh, look who has the biggest house, look who, you know, so, oh, he's got some nice stuff over there, he's got more stuff than I do. We start competing with other people. Now it's become a, you know, a race to the top, who's got the biggest, best toys? And I'm no longer content with what I have, because now I see other people, I see what they have, and, and I don't have it. There's diminishing returns past that threshold of having enough. In other words, what I'm saying here is that thousands of years ago, Agar was right. You can have too little, and you can have too much. If you're wise, you will ask the Lord for just enough. But you know, I do have a little bit of a problem. And no problem with this prayer, which it's hard to say, but I think he might have possibly stopped one request short. I mean, respectfully saying that, that, you know, if I was praying this prayer, I would probably ask the Lord for three favors. First, I don't want to tell a lie. I want to be a person of, of integrity. And then give me just enough. But then, Lord, please give me the ability to recognize when enough is enough. But help me see when I have enough. Because that's my problem. Dare I say, that's our problem? Our problem's not that we don't already have enough. I would venture to say that most of us in this room, maybe you know, most, all of us in this room, we do. Our problem is we often lack the ability to recognize that we, we already have everything that we need. And as long as we keep believing that lie that we don't, that, that, that more money or more food or more status or more fame or that that's going to make us happier, then our desires will continue to lead us to that slaughterhouse of greed. Our hunger or our appetites will, you know, if we leave them unchecked, will continue to lead us down that road of destruction. Because what we need is, is not more. What we really need is the ability to recognize when enough's enough, and that we most likely already have enough, and that we can be content with what we have. But we do most likely need some help from somebody else to do this. Wisdom comes from the Lord, and, and we need to be able to see this. We need to be able to put all of this in perspective. 
Because this is often not a lesson that we can learn within ourselves. We, we, I don't know why, we just can't see it. There's a story of a wise man who was, was walking down the road one day, and he came upon this other guy who was just weeping there on the side of the road. Just, you know, the guy was just all his eyes out. And, and the wise man asked him, he says, why are you weeping? And the man on the side of the road says, I am just so tired of being poor. I, I don't have anything. He says, in fact, all I have, all of my possessions are right here in this bag next to me here. And, and he points to the little ratty little bag next to him, and the wise man sees the bag, and he thinks, oh, okay. So he grabs the bag, and he just starts running off. And he hides from the man. And the man begins to cry all the more. And he cries to the Lord, he says, Lord, I have nothing now. Everything has been taken away from me. And, you know, he gathers himself up, he goes looking for that wise man who took his bag, and a mile down the road, he finds his bag sitting on the side of the road. You know, just, just waiting for him there. He comes, you know, up on that bag, and he, he starts laughing and shouting, happy. He says, thank you, Lord. I, I found my bag. I'm so happy. I, I have my bag back. And at that moment, the wise man jumps off from behind a bush next to the road there, and he says, I didn't get it. Five minutes ago, that bag was just making you cry. It was making you miserable, and now... It's making you celebrate. You see, it's all perspective. It's all a matter of, of perspective. And I'd like to think that the gospel does that for us. You know, <coughs> what the wise man does for that man in the story. I'd like to think that the gospel changes our perspective. Just a little bit. So that we're able to think differently about, about what we have or, and who we are and what we don't have and, and how to be content. How to see what we have and be happy with that. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, starting in the middle of verse 11, he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Then he goes into this famous verse that, you know, it's really about being content. It's not about, you know, jumping over a tall building in a single bound. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a words about contentment. He says, I can do all this. He says, I can be content in every, in, in, every situation through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always found this to be an amazingly challenging passage. It, it, it's not because, you know, well, I mean, I, I don't identify with it, clearly. I can't read this passage here and and go, yeah, Paul, I mean, I know what you're talking about. I mean, I get it. I don't know why these other people get it, you know, but, you know, we get it. And that's what's so challenging, though. It's not that, you know, that. I mean, I get the other, I, I, I really identify with the other places where he says he struggles with sin and he feels weak. I can identify with those passages. But when I read this passage, I think, I don't, I don't identify with this. I would like to be like this. I would aspire to be like this. I would love to be able to say, you know, that's true of me too. But it's not. Paul can come along and say, you know, after years and years of walking with Christ, he comes along and says, you know, my sense of value, my sense of worth, my, my happiness, my joy is not dependent upon how much money's in my pocket or how much money's in my bank account or how much food I have in my belly. He says, it's not any of those things. He says, I, I found a different source of, of satisfaction in my life. And he says, I've learned the secret. He says, I know the secret to being content. He's going to share it with us. 
And, and what Paul knows and what the wise men of Israel knew before, before you know, way before this is that there is no amount of money or food or fame or success there is no amount of any of those things that can satisfy our hunger. We're always hungry for more. There's no amount that will fill that, <clears throat> that gnawing hole with inside of us. We always want a little bit more and a little bit more. And we're going to want a little bit more after we get that little bit more unless, unless we learn the secret. And here's the secret. This is what Paul tells us. The secret to having enough in any and every situation is to realize that Christ is enough. To realize that your, <clears throat> your relationship with Christ connects you with Christ, fills you with his spirit, and fills you with his strength. To know that Christ is, is with you and he's with you when things are, are going really well. And he's there when things are not going so well. It's Christ there inside of you when, when you have everything that you need. And Christ is there inside of you when you have very little. And he says, that's how you learn the secret, though. It's, it's, that, it's because of Christ inside of me, he says. It's because of the Spirit inside of me. It's because of the strength of God inside of me. I know now that Paul says, Paul says, I know now that that's enough. And I can handle myself. And it, no matter what the outside situations are in my life, whether something is given to me or whether something is taken away, he says, the Lord is enough. And that's the secret. A few hundred years later, Augustine of Hippo said this in one of his prayers. He says, Lord, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. He's saying, Lord, I, you, you made us with this desire. You made us with this appetite. You made us with this hunger. But it's a hunger, it's an appetite that it can only be filled and satisfied by our creator." by our Lord. Until then, our stomachs are going to growl. They're going to they're just yearn with this desire. Our, our appetites are going to keep pulling us into all these compromising situations. We're always going to be hungry until we hear and we respond to Christ's invitation. To come to Him. To come to Him at, at His table. And to be satisfied. In other words, the invitation of Christ to us is that after you've made yourself sick eating, eating cheap potato chips, and you've been doing that all your life, and you keep just gorging yourself on this junk, when you're done with that, Christ says, when, you, when you're just sick of that, when you realize that the, the, all of, you just they can't make it on that, then Jesus says, take my invitation. He says, come to me. Come to me. He says, come to me and sit at my table and wash that gluttonous, disgusting taste out of your mouth. Fill yourself with the bread of life and the wine of love. The Lord's invitation this morning comes from Isaiah 55. He says, come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And he's calling us to a feast here. Everything that we could need or want, we can be filled. He says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me. Listen to me. And eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Church, let's, let's hear and respond to this invitation. 
Let's find the bread and find the, the, the cup of Christ. And let's find those things that he's offering us. And let's be filled with that. Let's come to his table right now.